do they want me to hold this thing? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So just a little bit of background. Um, didn't get saved till I was 22. No church background prior to that, which sometimes is like a lot of baggage. But how many of you know it's also sometimes kind of helpful because you've got a different perspective sometimes. So don't be afraid of that perspective, but make sure you deal with the baggage. Okay. Uh, so began youth ministry as a volunteer, uh, eventually ended up on a staff where I was bivocational, and eventually that became the full-time gig like he talked about that everybody wants. Uh, however, when it is the full-time gig that everybody wants, how many of you know that suddenly means you're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Yes, so with the opportunity comes responsibility. And one of the things that I ended up running into in a 10-year stretch at uh, the first church I was on staff I was the direct intervention guy in 40 suicide attempts where I had to call 911, knock down doors, hold buckets while kids were puking, uh, help the state guy get, stater get the kid out of the car because the kid had rolled the car trying to kill themselves in the car wreck. Okay, so that was, this is not like, hey, I watched this little video YouTube thing and I'm going to portray some info to you guys. Since that time, uh, just this last week, or well, this week, I was in public schools on Monday, spoke four times to the students, and then again to the parents that night. So this is something I am actively doing. It isn't just something that I did. So I'm right in the middle of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the, the hands-on piece about how do you talk about suicide, why does it happen, all that kind of stuff. But I'm also going to kind of give you some other stuff. Pretty much everything I'm going to say is either on the front or the back of this. So if you're a good note taker, hey, go for it anyway. If you're like a spastic when it comes to taking notes, because how many of you have started taking notes for a class and about halfway through you're just listening and not writing it? Yeah. So this is for you, okay? Because I do remember those days, right? So pretty much everything I'm going to say is already written down for you because that way you can kind of listen because sometimes we hear better if we actually listen versus trying to write it down. Now, what did he say? Well, I wrote that down. I missed that other part, all that stuff, right? So I'm going to give some background stuff, then we'll dive in because... As culture has declined, as far as Christ goes, our job has gotten bigger. Okay, I grew up in a non-Christian home, didn't know Christians, didn't have a great praying grandmother, parent, or anything like that. But I still grew up in a culture where everybody knew what the Ten Commandments were, even though you didn't know they came from the Bible. Okay, everybody knew because every cartoon we ever saw had a devil on one side and, and an angel on the other. And even if you didn't believe in God, you knew there were good thoughts and bad thoughts. So how many of you know all that has disappeared? Right, so we are having to recreate, restructure, renew minds, disciple kids in ways that we didn't have to 40 years ago. Because 40 years ago, the pagan kid would come into church, and yeah, he might smell like cigarette smoke or whatever, but he did know there was a, a right and a wrong. He did know there was probably a heaven and a hell. He did know a lot of stuff. And how many of you know the students we're talking to today don't know any of that? As a matter of fact, they're still trying to struggle to figure out who they are, let alone what the truths are of life. So we've got a bigger job in front of us. So we're going to dive into the suicide, but I'm going to make some other statements first. One, we got to disciple our kids. And what this, here's what discipleship is, what Jesus said it was, putting into practice the teachings of Christ. Okay, how many of you know you can be inspired, you can be pumped up, you can be a lot? But if you don't have the principles that Christ gave us as a part of how we live our lives, how many of you know when the, when the waters rise, the rain comes down, the winds blows, those kids are falling apart, just like us adults do. Okay, if you're not built on the foundation, not just of his love, but of his word, his will, his way, those are for us to, to challenge our kids to. And not just with words, but with opportunities. I teach a class on discipleship, and a lot of times I'll have somebody come up and go, okay, we're going we're gonna to learn the Lord's Prayer. And everybody, well, I already know that. And they go, yeah, you do, but hold on. they will start the Lord's Prayer. How does it start? Give me the first two words. Amen. Our Father, boom. Let's just say we believe that. What does that mean, just for the people in this room? We're all family. Do we act in church like we're all family? No. We all have our own little thing. We all do our own stuff. See what I mean? If we can take the principles of Christ and get it to our kids, have the opportunity to put it into practice, our Father who art in heaven. If I ask for definitions of, of heaven from everybody in this room, how many different definitions would I get? How many people in the room? See what I mean? That just the core stuff that we throw around and act like we know what's going on, if that becomes a part of who we are and the way we respond, the way we live life, that's a foundation that takes care of suicide, 
takes care of the anger that's a huge cause and contributor to suicide and takes care of the wounds that we're going to get through life. Not if we get them, when we get them. It takes care of all that if we know God's word, his will, and his way on all those topics. But we don't have those kids. We've got to make those kids. That's why Jesus said to make disciples. So that's kind of the bottom line core challenge that we're faced with right now. But we do have to understand the suicide world because it's not something you're maybe going to deal with. It's not a maybe anymore. How many of you know it's a sooner or later or already has been? Yeah, it, it's, something, it's all around us. And if it's not immediately in your youth group, it's in your schools. If it's not immediately in your school, it's in your community. And some of you live in small towns when when you get a suicide, it rocks the whole town. I've done quite a few towns now where I come in after a suicide. And I speak to the schools, I speak to the administration, counselors, people, pastors, parents, anybody who will listen. So they can debrief it, function with it, realize why it happened and how do we prevent it from happening again. But again, it all gets down to discipleship. You know, are we teaching our kids, the people we're working with, our students, how to walk with Jesus and in the way that Jesus would have us walk? That's a huge challenge, isn't it? And how many of you, for that challenge to work, it's got to be ours. Okay, we just got to be regular folk that follow Jesus. And because we follow Jesus, it's like one beggar tells another beggar where to find bread. We found the bread. Let's help them find the bread too, okay? So that's just kind of a thing. Now, I'm going to give you some stuff that I just got from one of the schools I just did in December. When you think of suicide, there's usually more than one contributing cause. Okay, so, so think of that. Because a lot of times when a student ha gets to that point or a person does, they'll name an issue, but it's never an issue. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Okay, there's a bunch of pre-things that always have to happen. So I'm just going to read you the list. You've got it, but here's the things that freak kids out and get them to the point. This exact, I ask them this exact question. I give them an example, which I will, and then I say, so what, what do you think? People you know, people your age, what would get them to the point of thinking about taking their own lives? And it's things like graduation, reputation, discrimination, their weight, competition, popularity, spiders. Validation, sports, teachers, failure, alone, rejection, boyfriend, girlfriend, breakup, past trauma, family issues, school, friend group issues, work, trauma, expectations, loss, different points of view. Now, how many of you would look at some of that list and go, those are no big deals? Doesn't matter what it is to you. To a student, that can be the crushing final blow that literally gets them to think about taking their own lives, okay? We're dealing with the most fragile generation that I've ever seen. And I'm 68, okay? I haven't seen everything, but I've seen a lot. I've worked in post-communist countries. I've worked in just about every kind of geographic, demographic, you know, racial mix you can think of. This is the most fragile generation I've ever seen anywhere. Is right here, the kids we're working with in our communities. So recognizing that means it's not a simple fix. Recognizing that means, hey, you can't just say, suck it up, move on, all that kind of cliche stuff that maybe worked 30 years ago. None of that stuff's real anymore, okay? So having said all that, how many of you already, there was at least something in there that you kind of go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, good. So here's one of the challenges with suicide. What's your name? Okay, so Amy's in the front row. She's brave. I noticed there's only one brave person in the whole room. That's kind of amazing because in youth ministry, you got to be David's, okay, like crazy brave. So here's Amy. Let's say Amy's my neighbor, and I've known her her whole growing up life, and, you know, she used to babysit her kids when they were little, and if my wife needs some extra house, Amy comes over, and she pays her some money, and life's good, right? So one day I see Amy, she's headed off to school. I say, hey, Amy, you look tired, and she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about a big project, didn't get any sleep. No big deal. Next day I go, hey, Amy, you look hungry. She goes, yeah, 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 I woke up late, didn't have time for breakfast. No big deal. Next day I look over the fence and go, hey, Amy, you look suicidal. Can I say that? No. See, we don't have a way to talk about something that we have to talk about. So what we've got with this goofy little cartoon strip, and how many of you know this is completely reproducible by anybody? Yeah, this is stick figure stuff. You don't have to be a genius to do this, okay? So what we do is we use this to explain it, talk about it, and get that initial process started where somebody's going to get some help. I have drawn this on barf bags on airplanes side of my truck in a parking lot 
napkin at a birthday party, scrap of paper in a park, and those are all just with the complete strangers. I've drawn this hundreds of times, depending on who I'm working with, what group it is, or what individual, just to get the party started, so to speak, so we can talk about something that we can't talk about. So here's kind of the big picture. So corner up in the top, pretty easy to see. What you've got right here is a human being, okay? Can, you, can you everybody do that, give them a chance? Good, I'm glad. There are artists in the room, need not apply. Okay, so that's a wall which represents obstacles or challenges that we face. Down in the bottom left-hand corner there, that's a carnivorous Pac-Man. So how many of you have ever played a game with a Pac-Man? Yeah, what's that dude do? He chases you across the screen, right? Okay, now how many of you know as Christians, we actually know who that is? Yeah, he's got a name, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. When I'm in a public school setting or talking to kids that may not quite have made the Christ connection yet, I just talk about it. He represents the fears people have. And how many of you know that's one of the main tools that Satan has anyway? Because how many of you know when you're afraid, you do stupid things? Yeah, fear just freaks you out. I was a lifeguard for years in the summers, and drowning isn't the problem because most of these people are drowning and screaming and yelling and thrashing. If they could just apply the energy they're expending, they could break an Olympic record swimming to shore. But fear has taken over, and it's become panic, and they do all the wrong things. So fear is a powerful reality. And the other challenge is, we're going to say we put the number 10 up in the top corner, is that most challenges take more than one attempt to get past. Okay, how many of you have lived long enough to know that's almost always true? When you're 15, you don't know that. You think you should be able to do it. How many of you have already dealt with teenagers who are frustrated because they can't do something? And you're looking at that and going, dude, you're barely trying. Or you're just getting started, okay? The average kid falls down 300 times before they learn how to walk. So how many times does that mean they got up? 300. Do our kids have that kind of resilience? No, not generally speaking. So we got to help them get a perspective that, hey, you're going to have to try more than once to get past stuff. And the things that are hardest for you to learn oftentimes are the things that will take you the farthest in life. The things that you know that you know that you know that you know, you learned all those the hard way. How many of you can look at your own life and the things that you know that you, kn yeah, you learned it the hard way, didn't you? It wasn't easy. But you know it. You know that you know it. Which means you can pass it on. So that's where we start. Now let's just say they don't go past that first challenge. So now always a new obstacle, always a new challenge. Now maybe their motivation is down to six tries. Pretty common. Goes down a little bit, okay? Meanwhile, carnivorous Pac-Man's getting bigger. When it was soccer ball size and you were cruising and you're overcoming your challenges and your obstacles, soccer ball size, kick it out of the way, hey, no big deal. Yeah, it's there, but we're doing good. But after you've had a failure or two, he starts to get bigger. Louder voice, harder to ignore, harder to say, hey, no big deal. And let's say they don't get past that one. Now, you always have a new obstacle, always a new challenge, always. By the way, I'm 68, and I remember asking people when I was younger as a new Christian, I said, hey, does it ever get any easier? And the smiling old saints would say, no. And guess what? They were telling the truth, <laughs> okay? The older you get, it just gets more complicated because you're still facing things you've never faced before, and your web of people has grown, you know, when you're 15, it's you, yourself, and that's it. When you're my age, I got kids. I got grandkids. I pray for them every day. Why? Because they're super important to me. You know, that's just my immediate tribe that have my last name. You know, there's a whole bunch of other people that are in my world, too, that weren't there when I was 15. So it just gets more complicated. So the obstacle challenge thing, it's real. Let's say they don't get past that one, okay? Always a new obstacle, always a new challenge. Meanwhile, the carnivorous Pac-Man is bigger. Now he's more like a, you know, a beanbag chair. Really hard to ignore, really hard to say, hey, no big deal. And he, here's something I will almost say is universal amongst teenagers. They don't sleep well at night. And you know one of the reasons why they don't sleep well at night? Because they've got voices that are reminding them of everything they've done wrong. E every fear they have, every expectation that isn't being met. How many of you know they don't know how to shut that down? which is why discipleship is so key. Because how many of the discipleship says things like this in Matthew 6? Don't worry about tomorrow. 
How many of you know we are really good about worrying about tomorrow and the next day and what I do when I get out of high school? Who am I going to marry? I mean, we've got a list that just never stops. So, again, the carnivorous Pacman is real. His voices are real. They're audible to those students you're working with. Okay, and so all those things add up. Now, part of the challenge is those first three panels on the top, the person still looks the same. But how many of you know as far as their heart's going, it's, it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker, which is why often in a suicide reality, let's say it happens over a weekend, which is really common, unfortunately. People will say on Monday, uh, you know, at school, they go, hey, where's so-and-so? Oh, dude, didn't you hear? No, what happened? Oh, he took his life on Sunday. Yeah, but he was fine on Friday. So top panels all the way through till Friday. But see how much weaker they are already? And the students that I have worked with, if I can get the full backstory, not only does it include obstacles and challenges, but it includes some really ugly wounds. You know what the abuse percentage is amongst teenagers, male and female? Way over half. Includes the kids that go to your church. Includes the kids that come to youth group. And that's one of those wounds that becomes a challenge that if they don't get past that, they don't deal with it, they don't work it through, they're just a slow bleed. Okay, so that's why the top part can look, you know, pretty normal. But let's just say, again, Amy's my neighbor. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to say, hey, are you suicidal? But I'll say, hey, Amy, why don't you come over after school today? My wife's got some extra work this weekend. Why don't you sit down with her and you can see if you want to do it? And she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. So she comes over, my wife draws this. And then she goes, Amy, where are you at on this? Because here's the thing about these ones. Those are ones where you actually start to look different, act different. You start to see symptoms. But those first three, you don't ever see anything. And so, you know, Amy's talking to my wife, and she goes, wow. Because here's the deal, and I've heard this from thousands of teenagers. I say, hey, how many of you have ever felt bad and you don't even know why? Boom, every hand goes up. Because how many of you know being a teenager is a mix of emotions and reality that twist everything? They perceive what isn't happening. They feel what isn't real. How many of you, all those things are true? You talk to teenagers and you say, hey, how many of you ever said this before? If I don't get something to eat tonight before I go to bed, I'm going to. Are you really going to die? No. You know how long you can go without food? Three weeks. Easy. If you've got enough fluids, maybe five. But does your stomach tell you that? Absolutely not. Or how many of you ever heard a, a, a noise at night and you're trying to go to sleep and all of a sudden you hear a <coughs> just outside your window? How many of you have turned that into a psychotic killer trying to get in the house? Yeah, you're smiling because you have, okay? Those are feelings. They're not truth, folks. But how many of you know that teenage world is feelings with a capital F? See, so that's a challenge. So, so Amy sits down and Amy goes, well, wow, um, you know, I got this one class that's killing me and Right now, my folks are fighting. And if I bring home another bad grade, that could be it. If they get a divorce, I'm going to have to go live with my grandparents. And how many of you know that's not an uncommon scenario with the students you're working with? Okay, so my wife says, well, Amy, what is it, the class? And so she tells her and goes, she's, you know what, I'm actually really good at that. Because here's the deal. Every one of these challenges and issues that I've ever heard of, everyone, they always have answers. It just is for the person in the middle of it they don't know what they are. And even though they Wikipedia it and they Google it, they just don't get the answers they need. It's just not there for them. Okay? But real people like us, if we don't have them, we've got a network of people who've got them. Okay? So, so Amy kind of goes, well, you know, this one class. And then my wife goes, you know, my husband does this stuff with anger and conflict. And he knows your dad pretty good because they fix the fence every time the wind blows it down. So maybe he can talk to him. And then maybe he could figure out how to deal with your mom. And then you wouldn't have to worry about living with your grandparents. But how many of you know you don't get that solution path unless you got a starting point? See, and that's the challenge with the students we're facing. They're going through all kinds of ugly stuff. And how many of you right now have a few kids that are going through stuff you almost can't believe what they're going through? It's so bad. Exactly. I mean, there, there are worst case scenarios that reality TV shows wouldn't even believe. You know, they oh, that's all scripted. I said, nah, <laughs> that's the kid I've got. Okay? So you walk it through like that. Now, if they get to this point, this is where it gets really challenging. Because at this point, I mean, multiple attempts. Chances are, if you have a student that gets to the point of t uh, making an attempt, 
they may be there for a while. And so you've got to be a huge safety net. And we'll talk about how do you build a safety net. But you've got to have a safety net for them because it's not necessarily like one touch from the Lord or one whatever is just going to like pop them loose from it. When they get to that point of actually trying to take their own lives, the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy is also the roaring lion. And here's the strategy of the roaring lion. Let's pretend you're all gazelles, and I'm a roaring lion. You don't have to be afraid of me because you know where I am. But do you know what the point of the roaring lion is? To spook everybody to run into the path of the devouring lions. So it's not the noise that gets you in trouble. It's where it takes you that takes you down. Does that make sense? If you get, because if you watch the, enough of the National Geographic specials and there's all these gazelles hanging out the water, there's always lions around them. And as long as they stay together, they're okay. They got horns, they got hoofs, they're okay in a group. But what's the roaring, roaring lion finally do? Gets them spooked and as they start to run away, who are the devouring lions picking on? The weak one, the slow one, the one that gets left behind. See, so that's why we got to create a safety net for them because they've already been singled out. They feel alone. They're on their own. And so we've got to be able to pull them to their world. So you can see how the progression goes. And, and for Amy now, she's got not only does she have some immediate help, but how many of you know as soon as you take care of one issue, the word hope starts to creep in? And, and the, a lot of students we've got, they don't have much hope. They look at their three strikes you're out world that they have lived in for however long, and, and they don't see it ever getting any better. But if you can take care of at least one area, it's like, oh, okay, maybe there's hope here. So I'm going to give you a real-life example of a gal we worked with. So she was a junior in high school, top 10, straight-A student, and she had met the guy of her dreams. Okay, so how many of you already have middle school kids who think they've met the guy or gal of their dreams? Okay, they haven't, but they think that. And here's the scary part, they wholeheartedly think that. Okay, when I'm talking to parents, I say this. Look, guys, when your students are in relationship, it's marriage minus the ring. And depending on what their personal guidelines are, they do everything that married people do. Don't they? Yeah. So if it's marriage minus the ring, what does that mean when they break up? It is divorce minus the paperwork. It's a huge deal. Well, when I was 15, I, I had a girlfriend or two. Sometimes I couldn't even remember their name. You know, because it was such a casual thing. It was like, we well, saw him at school, and we had five-minute phone limits. So, I mean, you really you didn't know him. How many of you know with a cell phone, you, you know them? You know, I mean, they, they are falling asleep together, watching TV together, flipping pictures back and forth. They shouldn't be flipping back and forth. I mean, they know each other, okay? You know, and if they have enough time, they biblically know each other. Again, depending on personal boundary lines. So that, that relationship reality that they have is not what the parents understand. So when th they go home and, you know, hey, I, you know, Johnny dumped me today, dad's like, oh, don't worry about it. There's more boys out there. But is the kid thinking it that way? Oh, no, that's devastating. So, again, that, that's it. So here's this girl, top 10, straight A's, yada, yada, met the guy. Airing was cool to about November when he dropped her. And how many of you know breakups in youth groups are always ugly anyway? This one got really ugly. So she missed a little bit of school. Now what happens to your grades when you miss school? Especially when you're top 10, straight A's. All you got to do is be an A minus. And are you in top 10 anymore? Gone. Okay. So she's a junior top 10, which means her friends, freshman, sophomore, and junior year, have been all the other top 10 kids. That's her crew, right? So not only is she not, you know, she's kind of like lost her personal identity of, hey, I'm, I'm the smart kid. She's lost that, you know, quantitatively lost that. Okay, now she's lost her crew of friends. So that's obstacle one, obstacle two. Obstacle three is she misses a little bit more school because she's just depressed about stuff. In our particular school district at that time, if you missed enough days of school, you didn't get credit for the whole semester, regardless of what your grades were. So what that meant was now she is not even going to graduate with her friends because she's just lost a whole semester. So those were the three biggies that just like smacked her within about a month period. And then she got to that point where every little thing, bottom row, every little thing would spin her off and she'd make an attempt. She made about seven really serious attempts between overdoses, wrecked her car at a high speed. Uh, she was going to get in front of a train drunk one night. 
which is another story. Okay, I mean, she really spiraled out. But again, at the beginning of the year, looking at her, you wouldn't have seen that in her. And here's the thing with the, the suicide world. Most people that try to tr take their own lives are not homeless people. They're people that have had some level of success, okay, and we're usually surprised by who they are. How many of you know an awful lot of peace people, athletes, actresses, actors, public figures that have taken their own lives in the last five years? Yeah, a huge amount. And you're looking at them going, dude, what's the deal? Man, you got millions in the bank, you're popular, yada, yada, yada. They're still bleeding on the inside. They still haven't worked stuff through. They're, they're still hurt and not making it. So she gets to that point and boom, now she's making an attempt, like I said, say seven really serious attempts. But here's the deal, we started to work backwards. And the first one was we helped her get her GED. Now, if you've been a top 10 kid, are you excited about getting your GED? No. But we had to help her realize, hey, in the long run, no one will care. But I, no, in the long run, you overcome this little obstacle as little as you think it's be. And the kid was smart. I mean, it didn't take her long at all, passed all the tests, no big deal. But here's what it did. Now it allowed her to go to community college. And initially there was pushback there because like, yeah, but what if they asked me what my GPA was in high school? I said, they don't care. If you're on the campus, you're a college student. So GED, community college campus, got her AA, got her four year, met a guy, got married. So every issue that she had worked backwards once we got her started. And that's the challenge you're gonna face with these kids. And here's what you can't be afraid of, the issues they present to you. How many of you have ever been tempted to show major shock on your face when a student tells you what they tell you? You should, Ho hopefully at some point you hear stuff that just freaks you out. I've heard several things. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll throw one at you just so that you can be more prepared. Okay, maybe about a couple of them. So I remember early on, and I've been around a while, so we got goth kids started to come to the youth group, which is cool, because a few of them got saved. And this one kid hangs out after church afterwards and he goes, okay, so, like this forgiveness stuff, like it's real? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like he could forgive you for anything? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, okay, here's the deal. There's this group in our, our area that uh, to join it, you got to have sex with a goat. And uh, I'm in the group. <laughs> now, how many of you know my face naturally would have gone to some form of disfiguration <laughs> at that one, right? Instead, I had to go. Oh, yo, dude, how long you been in it? <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, everything in me is battling to not like freak out on him, right? And he's like, well, you know, a while. And, you know, and so we kind of got really casual about that. But here was the deal. How many of you, if I had freaked out, he would have run away? Yeah, so you're going to hear stuff, whether it's abuse, incest, drug addiction, you know, cultic parents and what they're doing and the kid gets involved in it. I mean, you're going to hear stuff sooner or later. You're just like, you want to throw up. Okay, so just be ready for that. But if you can listen to it, and, and here's what's really cool. Even if you don't have the answer at the moment, if you listen once, how many of you, who are they going to talk to the next time? You. And even if you don't get it, ask questions. So does that mean, you know, do some clarifying stuff. Because here's the deal about clarifying. If you're asking clarifying questions that says to them, he really wants to know. You know, he really wants to get this. Even though he didn't get it the first time, he really... So ask, get good asking good questions. Just don't be afraid of it. Just be ready to dive into the mess, the muck, the whole bit, right? So this gives us a chance to identify it and kind of talk about it. And if you're talking in a preparatory manner, so I do a lot of suicide prevention stuff in public schools and the churches and stuff. And I'll say, hey, how many of you like have friends you're worried about? Well, every kid's got a friend they're worried about. I said, this is a way you can talk about it with them. Even though I know full well some of the kids I'm talking to are in this somewhere that need the help because how many of you know if you show up as the expert and say hey you know your youth pastor had me come in because I'm like the suicide dude and he told me all of you are screwed up so like I'm here today to fix you how many of you know every obstacle and wall that they can they're going to put up to protect themselves from you yeah so you got to be able to hey how many of you have friends and you're worried about them this is the way you can help your friends so it's kind of a back door in now there's some challenges with that that they need to understand and so do we Anybody know uh, or remember or you're looking forward to it? What magical thing happens when you turn 25? Car insurance drops. How many of you aren't there yet? 
Okay, be encouraged. Okay, <laughs> magically, statistically, when you hit 25, your car insurance will drop. Because for decades they have known, and they didn't know why, that you just became a better driver, statistically. Here's what they know now. Guess when you're finally fully mentally and emotionally developed? 25. Okay? You're working with kids who are 14 right now whose parents are treating them like they're adults. Aren't they? They're saying to their kids, hey, in two years you're going to be driving on your own. I won't be there, so you got to start making adult decisions now. They can't make adult decisions. Even if they're that 14-year-old boy who's been shaving for a year. Even if they're that 14-year-old girl. My two girls at 10 were fully developed women. We had to teach them refusal skills because they were cute 10 year olds <laughs> who guys thought were 18. Okay? So, again, they mature so quick physically sometimes, it doesn't mean they've got it emotionally or mentally. So, prepping our kids to be able to say, hey, look, guys, how many of you are looking forward to the day you're going to drive? Yeah. Well, did you know your car insurance is going to be astronomically high? Yeah. Guess what happens when you're 25? I don't know. Well, this is like a, an in for them to realize, hey, until you're 25, you're not fully mentally and emotionally developed. So what that means is if you're struggling with life and you have to ask questions, don't ask your friends. Because how many of you know when you're 15, you go to your friends, and how many of you can remember being 15 and getting really bad advice from really good friends? Yeah, even good Christian friends, bad advice. Because they don't have enough experience yet. They're, they're not fully developed. How old was Jesus when he started to minister? 30. How old was John the Baptist? 30. Okay. David is a teenager, and he had a great example for us. But how many of you know he still did some really stupid things in his young years? Yeah. David and Goliath to be admired. Other issues? Not so. Okay. You know, I mean, he started picking up wives like, oh, she's kind of cute, <laughs> you know, like all along the line. You know, he's like, oh, there's number one, number two. I don't even know how many he ended up with. Right. That's not mature, folks. Okay. Uh, quick freebie lesson on Spanish. Anybody here speak Spanish? Okay. Que es la palabra para handcuffs? Esposas. <laughs> yes. Okay. The word for handcuffs in Spanish is like plural, plural wives. Porque para mí en la pasado un ladrón, entonces cuando yo tengo mi testimonio para la gente, porque una noche con los Alicia, los esposas. Okay? So that's just kind of reality, you know, is that, is that that whole multiple wife thing doesn't go very far because it's, it's a handcuff. But there's David, the great guy, doing stupid things because he was still young, okay? You just don't get there till you're older. So we've got to be those trusted people who are, you know, and some of you that aren't 25 plus yet, you're getting there. And you're farther road down than they are. So you do have things to pass on, okay? But don't be afraid to pull the older folk in to be that source of wisdom because there are certain things you can only get by living it and only by having been there and done that. I remember for me, I lost one of my college roommates right out of college. So I graduated at 22, took an extra year, had eligibility. Most of my roommates were 21. And I remember one of them, the night that he took his own life, he called one of his friends, said, hey, here's what's going on. I don't know what to do. And the last thing that he heard from his friend was, well, just do whatever you got to do. And how many of you know that's not something you say to somebody who's suicidal? Well, the guy took his life that night. So I lost one of my college roommates. If he had talked to somebody past 25, he would have got better answers. See, and that's a challenge we face with our students because how many of you know a lot of your students – their first response to get help is with friends and on the Internet. And those aren't the answers that are going to help them. And so just telling them that, that hey, when you turn 25, you're going to be different. You're still in a growing, maturing pattern, even though our culture says younger, younger, younger adult. How many of you remember the last time we had presidential elections? What age did they want to push for the voting age? 16. I'm looking at that. I'm going, you're kidding me. Well, I know they wanted it because the Democrats knew they could get more young people to vote for them than the Republicans could. Okay? That was all purely political, not realistic, not helpful, not healthy. But that's what we're pushing. So that's the challenge we're facing is that because when you start life, you base your life on emotions. How many of you remember babysitting little kids? What kind of stuff do they get emotional about? Everything. Okay? They are an emotional package with two legs. Okay, that's who they are, right? 
Well, you don't cross over and become a person with a life based on experience at 25. And so here you've got teenagers, you know, and younger preteens that are making purely emotional experience decisions instead of experience based decisions. And to know that there's people on that other side who have been around long enough to have learned from their mistakes. Because how many of you have made plenty of mistakes that you've learned from? When you're a teenager, you're still making mistakes. You just don't learn from them. You don't connect the dots that because I was an idiot on Tuesday, that's why Friday's bad. They don't connect that, okay? You know, and so you have. You've been around long enough to do that. So that's huge if they understand that, hey, i got to be able to talk to the older people. Now, here's some warning signs that sometimes you kind of see coming. These are all common ones. One's called cleaning house, and that just means this. They start to give all their cool stuff away. Is that normal? No, but guess why people miss it? Because they're getting all their cool stuff. If you're 15 and you got a friend and you're you're BMX bike racers or whatever, and he's got a $700 bike and he gives you that bike, are you going, dude, you're suicidal? No, you're going like, woohoo, I got a bike. So they miss it, okay? But if they realize that's a warning sign, then all of a sudden, oh wait a minute, that's not normal. That's a warning sign. We worked with a guy up in Tacoma, he had a, a young man in his youth group. He had made an attempt. He was going to live. He was in the hospital. So they go to his house to see if he left a note, and everything in the kid's bedroom was gone. The only thing left was the furniture. No clothes, no, no music, no videos, no electric, nothing. It was gone. He had given everything he owned away, and nobody noticed, including his parents. Okay? So not uncommon to give all their cool stuff away. If there's a divorce, and it's either with the parents or as in a dating scenario, because how many of you had your folks get a divorce? Mine did. Okay, how many of you know that's like the gift that keeps on giving? I mean, that's not an event that comes and goes, is it? No, you deal with that the rest of your life. Okay? So, so if a kid's already been through that with his folks and then throw in a divorce in their version of dating, how many of you know that's two huge strikes against them? And they're probably not only bleeding from their parents' divorce, because how many of you know every time it's, how many of you had to do the uh, every other weekend thing where you had to go back and forth? You reopen the wound every time you go back and forth, don't you? Yeah, because one parent's pushing this way, the other parent's pushing that way. They, they want you to love them and hate them. I mean, it just gets crazy when you're a kid trying to deal with that. So those are warning signs. Even though they're common, they're still warning signs, okay, like be on the alert. If they get to a don't care mode, Okay, how many of you, when you, you were teenagers, took two or three showers a day sometimes? Because you're just in that total crazy hygiene realm. Okay, how many of you know you have kids in your youth group that are like that? Well, I, I raised three teenagers at one point. They're all out of that stage now. But I remember when two of them left at about the same time, the way college and, and, and work worked for them, our power bill dropped $35 a month. Because, no joke, because of the showers and the clothes we didn't have to wash, okay? I mean, they're just like hygiene freaks, right? Well, for all of a sudden, they go from two or three showers a day to two or three days without a shower. That's a I don't care mode. They don't change their clothes. They show up exactly the same way they went to, because they slept in their clothes. That's a I gave up. They don't care, okay? Distinct warning signs. This is one that doesn't get seen for a lot of different reasons, but if all of a sudden they become sexually active, and that wasn't their norm before, okay? The one girl that I talked about initially, you know, one guy forever, she'd met the guy. Well, at some point, he's out of the picture now. And at some point, it was like any guy. And I remember asking her, and I said, so how come you went from like one guy forever to any guy? And here's exactly what she said to me. She said, for 15 minutes, I can pretend that I'm loved. And that should break your heart. Here's a kid that's so desperate for something to hang on to. And that's why it's a warning sign. You know, unfortunately, the way core culture rolls, they're like, going, oh, dude, you're the man. Or, oh, dude, you're the girl. Now, how many of you know the girls are notching their belts now? Yeah, it's not just the guys anymore. The girls are notching their belts. How many guys can you take down? Oh, I've been with seven. I've been with nine. Well, I'll tell you what. You take something precious and use it like it's a soccer ball. At some point, that's all it ever is. It's not the precious anymore. It's the soccer ball. You just kick around, you know? So, again, that's a warning sign. Uh, if they get into the drug and alcohol world, it's like I see a few pairs of glasses in this room. How many of you, if you take your glasses off, you're basically blind? Okay. When you take your glasses off, that's what it's like when you get drunk or high. 
you can't see what's going on around you. Because 80% of all suicide attempts happen under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So when somebody gets drunk or high, it's not that their problems disappear, it's just as they can't see them till they get this close. And they panic and they do stuff they would never do sober. The one girl, she'd come to church still. She never made an attempt when she was sober. But then she started getting in her car, heading home. And at that time, Madonna had a song out that was Kill Yourself. And she liked Madonna. So she'd plug in her Madonna song. And by the time she got home, you know, 20 minutes later, she's calling me and she's thinking about taking her life. Because that stuff would just flood into her brain. And with all the issues going on that she hadn't worked through yet. It's just, you know, so that's that part of that challenge is, is that drugs and alcohol, you j it kicks you over the edge. 80% of all suicide attempts, 80% of all first crime committed, 80% of all unwanted sex, all happens under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Because you let your defenses down, you don't think right. And how many of you know the scriptures say that we shouldn't be drunk on wine, but that we should be drunk on the spirit? Yeah, and it becomes an either or at some point. You know, because the drunk on wine produces a voice for the other spirits to speak loud and strong into our voices. And they're obviously not positive. If there's death talk, and death talk can be like this. You're like going, so what do you think it would be like to die fast? W wh what do you think it would be like to die, to, die, to die slow? So I got a friend. How many of you know as soon as the kid says, I've got a friend, they're really talking about themselves, right? Okay, so I got a friend, and they were wondering, like, if a Christian commits suicide, can they still go to heaven? That's death talk. You don't think about that stuff unless you're thinking about that stuff. Okay? Unless you're, you talk about it because out of the heart, what does the, where does all the stuff in the heart come from? The abundance of the heart. The words come out. Abundance of the heart, right? So they start throwing out questions like that. They're actually, they're, they're playing with it. And sometimes they're doing a couple things. One, they're trying to figure out a plan. And they're not necessarily going to come like the one girl I talked about. One night she called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. She says, hey, I'm drunk. I know when the train comes through town, you cannot get here in time to stop me. And she was right. So that night, I called 911, and pretty soon I heard the Lacey police. And that night, Lacey police kept her alive. She was drunk, so she's in the 80% reality. Okay, and there was nothing I could do. That was a very distinct plan. Sometimes their plans will sound more like this. So, you know what, Mike? My mom's got so many pills in the in the medicine cat, I'd kill like 15 people. That's a plan that they just threw right in front of you. Or they say, you know, there's that one bridge over the freeway. Man, if you went off that, there's no way you could live. That's a plan. Or if they say, you know what, I know where my dad keeps his gun and I know how to get the ammo. That's a plan. That's not just conversational talk. They just threw a plan at you. That's a warning sign. Okay? And that's why you got to be able to be comfortable to be able to kind of dive into this. Because how many of you know if you hesitate, sometimes that's, that was the one chance you had? You know, if you hesitate. I, I played sports all the way up to Division I. And one of the things my coaches said, which is 100% through, through, true through all of life, and he said, if you have to think about it, it's too late. And in any kind of acting sport, how many of you can see that if you have to think about it, it is too late? Boom, that opportunity has gone. Okay, you had a moment, and that's all you had. And if you have to, oh, man, I don't know. Should I talk to him? Gee, what do I say? How many of you know sometimes that moment was it? That was gone. You know, and you got to be able to dive in. And so, so if that comes up, death talk, death art. H how many of you have seen some pretty dark little doodles from your kids? Yeah, sometimes that's just the, the world they live in. If it's new, it's a warning sign. Okay? If they go down the dark art. If the plan comes out like I talked about. And then isolation and fear. All of a sudden, kids are freaked about it, everything. Dude, I don't know what to do when I get out of high school. I, I don't know what I would do if my girlfriend broke up with me. That's fear. And they start to push away. And I don't know why we do it, but when we need the help the most, how many of you know that's when we tend to push people away? Yeah, so just be aware when they're pushing away. That's a warning sign. Again, enemy's trying to isolate them, get them singled out so he can take them out. But that's just one of the warning signs. And then... This is the craziest one. I'm, it's not on here because I want you to write it down. Number one reason why there's depression amongst teenagers, number one reason, they don't get enough sleep. Don't get enough sleep, which is why discipleship is important.
His discipleship teaches you not to worry so you can go to sleep at night. Discipleship teaches you that the Lord has what he does and you have what you do and you can't do what he does, so just do your part. Discipleship teaches you what's yours to carry and what's yours not to carry. That's why discipleship is so key. Otherwise, you're just going to get fried. And how many of you know it's easy to get fried? It is. For us, it's really easy for them. So, again, those are all warning signs. Four things we can always do, and this is where we can expand, but keep them sober. How many of you know that should be a no-brainer? But how many of you know you've got kids that come from homes where they got lots of options, you know, legal options now for drugs and alcohol? So we got we got to just give them boundaries in that area. Yeah, even though it's legal doesn't mean it's good. Even though it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Okay, we got to address those things. And also help them process sorrow. There's a lot of things that build up. If you don't deal anger, it builds up. If you don't deal with sorrow, it builds up. All those weaken somebody. So if somebody's had a loss, you know, a grandparent, a family member, whatever, help them process that. Because how many of you know the grief cycle is something that takes years to go through? Yeah, be ready to walk through with them on that because it's real. And if they don't deal with it, it builds up, it, it blows up, okay? And then take them seriously. Don't ever blow off anything, ever. You'll never regret taking them seriously, even if they're dinking around with you. Because how many of you know they do dink around with us? Yeah, and I remember one kid starting to go, oh, dude, and he started to kind of lay it out. And I said, okay, here's what we're doing. He goes, oh, whoa, oh, whoa, oh, no, dude, I was just kidding. Because I, I was going to act on what he was saying. And he realized that really quick. He said, no, no, dude, I was just playing with you. I said, hey, dude, don't go down that road. He goes, okay. And here's the deal. Even if you overreact, what does that say to the student? He cares. Exactly right. If, if I got to that point, he's going to do something. And how many of you know if one kid in the youth group feels that way, what are they going to tell the other kids? If you need to, you can talk to him. If you need to, you can talk to her. They're not going to freak out on you. They're going to get you some help. And here's where the help kind of rubber meets the road is in a safety net. You can only do so much. Okay? Don't ever feel like it's your burden to carry a kid through this process. You know, I talked about me being the intervention guy, but I wasn't the safety net by myself. Okay, as soon as a kid would get to that point, 911 is great because here's the deal. They're trained first responders. And at least in the state of Washington, what happens is if they get, you know, if they pick up a kid for a suicide attempt, they automatically dump them in a hospital for a psych evaluation and a two or three day stay. And how many of you know that's exactly what they need? The challenge is the way our system is set up. Most of the time, people can't afford the mental health illness issues they have. You know what those cost a day? Thousands of dollars a day for the help that's out there. Anybody's got insurance, that's usually gone in a day or two, maybe three or four, maybe a week in a miracle. So, so the safety net, you know, so 911, don't be afraid to use it, okay? Coaches, teachers, parents, neighbors, friends, I mean, anybody that you can get into the safety net is huge. It's like the gal we talked about before. Not only was her mom in the safety net, it turned out her mom was suicidal. So we got a BOGO deal on that one, okay? <laughs> we got a two for one. Here's a mom who's really messed up who keeps pills and alcohol in the house just in case she wants to make an attempt. Well, that means they're available for her. So, so the parents, I mean, get as many people involved as you can and then have really good relationships with your school. Okay? They are not the enemy. They definitely see life differently than we do. Okay? But they're not the enemy. So, like, for this one gal, I would call the high school she went to and said, hey, she had a bad weekend. You know, has she already talked to somebody? And they go, yeah, she's already got a counseling thing set up at two. I go, great. Sometimes they would call me and say, hey, we think she's got pills, but she's not talking to us. Can you come in? Yes, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Okay, I built such a relationship. I still have it. I'm in public schools locally. I've been for 40 years. Okay, I, I had such a relationship where sometimes the school would call me and they said, hey, our counselors are out of town today for a training day. We know who you are. We know what you'll say. Can you please come in and talk to a kid who's sitting in the office right now? So I had complete permission to pray for them, talk spiritual stuff with them, the whole bit, because I was on the same team as the school teachers and counselors. When I do this stuff now in the public schools locally, you know, the teachers know, and they've already got their counselors on high alert that day, because they know these kids, when we start talking about this kind of stuff, these kids are going to respond and say, hey, I need help. And they do. 
So you got to have a safety net. So if you don't have one already, if you don't know local counselors, if you're not able to have your lead pastor be on board, if you don't have, you know, all the connections with parents and all that kind of stuff, take the time to build that. Because in the long run, that safety net is what keep a kid alive. Sooner or later, you're out of town. Sooner or later, you got to sleep. Sooner or later, your phone isn't working. Didn't charge it. You left it in the car, whatever. How many of you know you can't be the 24-7 person? But you can be a part of the safety net, and a lot of times you're the one who initiates it. Okay? So you guys have got some tools. Uh, questions? Feel free. And, and I'm here. I'll be here all weekend. So if you think of something. And here's the thing about the safety net. Talk to as many other youth leaders as you have in your crew so everybody's on the same page. Because was this complicated? No. Could you share this with your friends, your other youth workers? Yeah, you probably could. Try. Okay? They've recorded this. You can always, you know, download that and listen to it that way. But get on as many people on the same page as you can because the more volunteers you have at your setting that can get in on helping a kid out, how many of you know that's going to go a lot farther than if it's just you? Yeah, exactly. The bigger the safety net, the better chances you've got. You know, I'm blessed in the sense that all 40-plus suicide attempts that I worked with, they're still alive. And what's really cool is some of them are Facebook buddies that have been for now like 30-plus years. Okay, that particular girl that I talked about, she's done mission work over in when Yugoslavia fell apart and Croatia and Serbia and all that ugly stuff was going on because of all the horrific things she'd been through as a kid, which is part of the reason why she ended up getting to that point of trying to take her own life. Those are all healed wounds in her life now. And so she's ministered to women that have been through some of the most horrific things on earth that you can have happen. And she can look at them eye to eye and talk to them because she's gotten the hope, she got the help, and she's healed. So we're going to be working with messed up kids, but here's the reality. Healed kids with big scars have huge stories. And how many of you right now, our students need huge stories to help their friends? So I'm going to pray. If you want to stick around and ask questions, awesome. If not, I know we do need to eat at some point. So I know how that works. So thank you, Lord. Father, we always come in Jesus' name. <sighs> Lord, and it's for such a time as this, you've got us in our different locales. Little towns, small towns, big towns, everything in between because there's students there. And Lord, you love them, you care for them, and you need us to be our, to your hands and feet to help them. So help us take the tools we've received, learn from them, grow with them, equip others so we can be the safety net, see these kids not only get the help they need, but the Christ they got to have. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.